Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Live from St. Paul, Minnesota, we welcome you to another season of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers who are prepared to answer your questions and discuss important issues affecting citizens of Minnesota. Now, here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to the 32nd season of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you have joined us this evening for an hour of conversation with leaders of Your Legislature, and hence the snappy name of the program, Your Legislators. Uh, and we're going to be talking about public policy issues that are of concern to you, the viewer. And we want to encourage you to call in and give our panel an opportunity to have a little interaction with you about the, the issues that are of concern with you. This is my 24th season with this program and I'm delighted to be your host this evening. Any day now they're going to figure out I don't know what I'm doing and replace me with somebody competent. But at least for now anyway I'm your host and I'm looking forward to being with you this hour and throughout the rest of this legislative session until whenever the legislature goes home. We won't start our annual guess the date that, that we exit business. We'll wait till we get into the business of the legislature a little bit before we do that. We'll begin this evening as we do each week by introducing our distinguished panel of guests who will help us unravel the mysteries of St. Paul. We have uh, some familiar faces, some faces that are new. There have been some changes at the legislature as a result of the elections on November 6 and some intra-party elections that have occurred and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Beginning to my immediate left, joining us uh, is uh, Representative Aaron Murphy. And I, we were talking about this before the program began. I think you've been with us one prior time, maybe. Is that right? This is actually my first visit. Is this your first visit here? Yeah, okay. Very first. All right. Well, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, and you have a change in position as well. So tell our viewers a little bit about that. And take a, take a few seconds to introduce yourself to our viewers. Tell them a little bit about where you're from, who you represent, and. Uh, and that sort of thing. Well, thank you for having me. I am uh, Aaron Murphy. I represent the Mighty Citizens of 64A and St. Paul, which is a district that uh, has St. Thomas University and McAllister College and Cafe Latte. People know Cafe Latte for its chocolate cake. It's delicious. Um, I'm starting my fourth term in the Minnesota House. I'm also a registered nurse. I teach a little bit at the University of St. Kate's in the program, uh, the nursing program there. And uh, recently was elected as the majority leader for the Minnesota House of Representatives, which is my, my, my big honor. And I'm delighted to be here with you tonight. We're delighted to have you. Frequent guest with us uh, from District 3 in Cook. Been a little change in his life as well. Senator Bach, tell our viewers a little bit about those changes that have occurred and what you're doing this uh, session. Well, I represent uh, the largest geographic district in the state. It's a big piece of the Arrowhead region of Minnesota. I often describe it as uh, the district where Minnesota loves to play. Uh, I represent all of the North Shore of Lake Superior, uh, all of the Boundary Waters, all, all of Voyagers National Park, and and after the most recent redistricting, I now represent the icebox of the nation, International <laughs> Falls. So uh, it's a wonderful district, uh, great constituents that still believe government is part of the solution to problems in our communities. And uh, the most exciting thing for me, I guess, over the last couple of years, many people probably think that it's uh, uh, winning an election and, and moving, making the transition from the minority leader to the majority leader, but. Uh, I now have four grandchildren, uh, three years old and under, and that's pretty exciting. And if, and if anything will make you think about the future of the state, the value of kindergarten, and K-12, and higher education, and economic opportunity, it's becoming a grandparent. So uh, I'm very excited about uh, the opportunity that presents us with this new budget, and, and hope we can uh, find a way to uh, find agreement and make some investments in what's important to Minnesotans. Senator Bach, by way of background, as I recall your prior visits with us, and you've been with us a number of times over the past few years, uh, I, I think you come from a construction background, if I recall correctly. Am I right about I, that? I, I spent my entire working career as a carpenter, and uh, I, I often talk about that because one of the attributes of carpenters is you learn how to solve problems, and if you don't solve problems, uh, you never get a building constructed. And that really is kind of the attitude I bring to the Capitol is, you know, let's roll up our sleeves, work hard, and, and, and resolve where we have differences. and, and I get the work finished and move on and do something else. Well, we're delighted that you're joining us. Also joining us, a frequent guest, been with us many times, Senator Hahn from Eden Prairie. Um, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. 
I, um, starting my fourth term, I represent uh, Eden Prairie and part of Minnetonka and the southwest uh, suburbs of the Twin Cities. Um, uh, our district is small geographically, not as large as Center Bach, but uh, it's, uh, it's got some advantages. It doesn't take uh, too long to drive from one end to the other. It's the home of the Vikings. That's where they're located. And uh, uh, was uh, elected this last, uh, after the election, to be the uh, minority leader in the Senate. Uh, and uh, we've gone through a transition, as I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about, uh, but it's an honor to serve the people of the state and, and uh, uh, serve the, uh, my caucus members as, uh, as their leader. Uh, had an interest uh, throughout the years in education and uh, certainly in health care issues. Uh, had a background in uh, business, worked for a long time for Dally Express, a uh, food manufacturing company, and I do some consulting now. And as I recall, your background as well, I, I believe you might have, you might have uh, spent some time on the school board in the Eden Prairie area? I did. Before I got elected to the legislature, I spent uh, eight years on the Eden Prairie School Board, which uh, frankly was a great uh, introduction to public policy and to education. And uh, I still believe that education is the most important thing that we do as a state. It's one of the largest budget areas we have. Uh, certainly affects the future, and uh, we need to keep working at it. So can we look to you for an encyclopedic knowledge of school <laughs> finance and all the ins and outs? Well, and so it, no, okay, well, never mind. <laughs> never mind. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> all right, very good. And finally, um, also joining us for the first time uh, from District 31A, Representative Kurt Dowd. Am I pronouncing that right? You are. You are. Right. You tell are. our viewers a little bit about yourself, and also tell our viewers where Crown Minnesota is, in certainly. case they don't know. Certainly, certainly. Um, I'm Representative Kurt Dowd. Uh, from 31A, as you mentioned, uh, which is um, uh, some of northern Anoka County, uh, cities of now then, uh, Oak Grove, um, Bethel, and then uh, Sherburne County, Zimmerman, Livonia Township, and then four townships in southwest Isani County. So Crown is actually five miles straight east of Zimmerman, um, and uh, uh, former Senator Rod Grams is from Crown, Minnesota, so that's why I always use that as my... Uh, my hometown, so not very many people know where it is. It's actually Stanford Township. It's not uh, Crown's not an incorporated city. So, but I live on what was my grandparents' farm. Uh, I'm in my second term, just beginning my second term in the legislature, and and uh, just recently elected House Minority Leader. So, I'm I'm glad you told us about now. Then uh, years ago, when I was in the private practice of law, I used to regularly go to Princeton and would go through now. Then and I always wondered how to pronounce it. Now I know. So uh, <laughs> my my universe has been expanded here, and this is a good thing. <laughs> All right, well, let's begin our program while we're waiting for our viewers to call in with their questions and, and kick off uh, this year's program, finding out what you folks are concerned about. Let's start with maybe a little around-the-table discussion about issues that you think are important to, to your constituents and what you might like to see coming out of the caucus. Let's go, um, let's go around the table the other way. Let's start with uh, Representative Dowd. What do, you, uh, what do you think? And we'll go, uh, we'll go around the table that way. You know, certainly, obviously, I think our biggest challenge this, this, uh, this year is going to be uh, balancing the budget and, and finding solutions that we can all agree upon uh, to get that accomplished. Um, I think, you know, obviously over the last couple of years, uh, we had a, a large budget deficit that we dealt with. I think that, um, you know, we have another one that's uh, quite a bit smaller. Um, we, we showed over the last couple of years with, with the policies that we put in place that you can do that without raising revenue, and, and uh, we feel like uh, Minnesota's economy is on the right track, so so we feel that uh, now wouldn't be the right time to raise taxes. So my hope is that we can do that without raising uh, taxes and, and putting any harm on middle class Minnesotans um, and and keeping this recovery going. So, Senator, well, I think uh, uh, certainly the budget is going to be a central issue, and there's a lot of components to that. Uh, I think uh, the health care exchange and health care generally is going to be a large topic, one that uh, I spent a little bit of time with the last couple of years and. I know that's been a priority for the governor, and, and uh, the majority certainly have indicated that. Uh, I have not always been in the same uh, uh, step with the governor on uh, his uh, preferences on that, but it's an important policy, important policy choice that we have to talk about, have to make decisions on. Uh, I think uh, that, that to me is going to be one of the more, more important issues that we're going to wrestle with. I think there's some very, very significant uh, challenges that we're going to face on that issue, so I think uh, that to me is going to be one of the more interesting debates that we're going to have. Senator? Well, n no question the overriding uh, work of this session is going to be resolving a, you know, another significant budget deficit. Uh, closely linked to it is going to be uh, an effort to reform the state's uh, tax system. Uh, property taxes across Minnesota have been spiraling out of control. Uh, in 2002, property taxes in Minnesota were about $4 billion statewide. This year they're $8.5 billion, uh, more than doubled in 10 years. And I, I think our revenue system needs some rebalancing to reduce some of the reliance on property taxes, specifically as it comes to funding schools. 
where the, the whole notion of uh, voter approved levies is creating a lot of disparities in school districts across the state. We've got some districts in the state that have got it uh, north of $1,800 a pupil in uh, voter approved levies. And then we have a group of districts, I think there's about 40 of them, that have zero, that for a number of reasons can't pass voter approved levies. So the idea that we can continue down the road as a matter of education policy of relying on voter approved levies is creating uh, disparities all across the state, something I think we all should be very concerned about. So it, uh, uh, it's going to be a, a, a tough conversation to have. Uh, it's always difficult to ask taxpayers to pay more, but we've been in this cycle of deficit after deficit after deficit, and the way I describe it is whether it's in your home or your business or your church, if you're constantly in this position of, of managing a crisis, it's very difficult to make uh, good decisions about the future. So I hope that uh, in the process of doing significant tax reform, reducing uh, property taxes, putting the other, the sales tax and the income tax on the table, uh, that we can find some new revenue uh, along with uh, spending cuts. And there are going to be cuts in this budget because the deficit is too big uh, to resolve just by raising revenue. That when we go home in May, uh, uh, we've solved the structural uh, budget problem that the state has and, and in a balanced way. Representative Anderson? I am. Um you know, I represent a district in St. Paul, but when I ran the first time and subsequent to that, and when I talked to the people in, in 64A, uh, they have always been really clear that they want us to think about the state as a whole. And I've had the good fortune to get to lots of parts of the state and talk with Minnesotans, and they're really practical people. And what I heard from them over the course of the last couple of years is they are really, I think, tired of the discord and the distractions of our politics and would like to see us focus on their priorities. And certainly education is a major priority for Minnesotans and I hear it among those of us at the table as well. Um, they want us to balance the budget for real and honestly and into the future. Um, and I think they understand that that's going to mean looking at both the spending side and the revenue side to do it because I think they're tired of the deficit after deficit after deficit. So I, I, I know we're going to focus on that budget, and I think we're going to do a good job for Minnesotans. We're going to make sure the schools are strong across the state. We're going to try and take some pressure off the property tax, which been, we've been relying on as we've been cutting the state's budget. That's been going up. And I think we're going to do it with a fair amount of humility um, and a little less drama, and I think Minnesotans will be happy about that. All right, well, we'll have a chance to discuss the specifics of these issues as we move through the program this evening. We have some questions from our viewers. Vel Elbow Lake wants to know whether or not there's going to be a bonding bill this year. Of course, typically the off year is, the so-called off year is the bonding bill year, but it's not unusual um, in the odd-numbered year to have a, uh, uh, to have a bonding bill. Let's, let's start with you, Senator Bach. What do you think? Well, I mean, historically, uh, bonding uh, has been done in the even-numbered years. Uh, you know, the last uh, two-year cycle, we did bond in both the budget year and uh, uh, and in the uh, election year. I would like to get back to uh, the only bonding we would do in the budget year would be uh, what we traditionally have done, and that traditionally has been kind of emergency things that have come along that we need to do. I mean, historically, I think we've been bonding for about 100 to 140 million dollars in. Uh, budget years and then a, a much larger number in uh, even numbered years and that would be my preference is we only we take up uh, emergency type things and I do believe we have to do a small amount uh, on the capital uh, last year the uh, legislature authorized about 44 million dollars of bonding for renovations to the state capital we're going to have to do something more on that this year in order to keep those renovations going uh, until next year uh, when the normal bonding cycle would come up Representative Murphy, bonding bill, any thoughts? Well, you know, I think that uh, when you drive through the state of Minnesota, it's clear that we have some issues with our infrastructure. So I would say, uh, yes, we should consider a bonding bill. I think we should consider uh, the infrastructure needs. The Capitol obviously has uh, tarps on it right now. Uh, I remember Representative Dean Erdahl bringing in a big piece of uh, part of the Capitol that had come off the Capitol, suggesting that we need to pay attention to this, and I think we do. You know, it is uh, inexpensive right now to borrow. The interest rates are low. So I think we should make a decision on this question based on what's best for Minnesota, and there are certainly needs. And the result of doing some bonding means pe putting people to work, and, and I think that's also important. That's a good, that would uh, be good for Minnesota. Senator, your thoughts? I, I tend to agree with uh, Senator Bach. I, I think that uh, he's right that over the past number of years, we've had typically pretty significant bonding bills in both uh, years of the biennium. And, 
I think that's uh, kind of a bad habit we've gotten into. Uh, uh, we've had two rather large bonding bills in both last uh, two years. Uh, I think it makes sense to try to focus on the budget in the first year, and uh, I think Senator Brock is right. There are some things that we probably should address with bonding. I hope we can do it in a more limited way. I think the capital project is a good idea. Uh, I think there's a lot of bipartisan support to do some things for that. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, to try to restrain ourselves from getting too, uh, I guess, uh, grandiose in our expectations for bonding the first year would be good and try to focus on doing the, bu doing the budget. I think I ag agree also with Senator Bach. I think uh, traditionally the, the uh, even-numbered years have been the years that we, that we do the larger bonding bills. Um, I think there's a little uneasiness about borrowing too much money uh, in this first year of the biennium until the budget's solved and we know what we're uh, if we're if we're increasing taxes to, to do that and and um, you know I know my caucus uh, particularly is is uh, committed to solving that first and then we'll talk about bonding but uh, I'll agree with Senator Bach and, and Han as well and I th actually I think we all agree on this that the, the capital is something that we need to do we've started that restoration project I, I think the capital is a, a treasure to the state that we that we need to take care of and and I think there's broad bipartisan support in all four caucuses frankly for for uh, keeping that project moving along, so uh, but we'll look for a, uh, you know, to to have a real conversation about uh, a larger bonding bill in the second year of the biennium. I think is what we would prefer. We have a viewer from Appleton that wants to talk about uh, education. Uh, we've got a specific question, but you know, feel free to address it more broadly as well. Let's start with you, Representative Murphy. You okay. touched on that question. Viewer from Appleton wants to know: Will K-12 school districts receive state funds on schedule this year? And and like I said, feel free to. Expand that a little bit if you think there are other issues we need to talk about, and let's have a little conversation across the table on that. So, Representative right. Murphy, go ahead. So, I think that uh, as we have uh, tried to balance the budget uh, uh, over the past number of years, uh, in this last decade, uh, we've used a number of gimmicks and um, and uh, one-time funding sources to be able to do that, and we've borrowed from our schools um, fairly fairly significantly. And I think you know it's time to stop doing that. So, for the viewer. Um, I don't think that we're going to borrow from the schools again um, to balance the budget. And that, that's why I think it's important that Minnesotans have, um, I said, I think believe uh, we need to balance the budget for real and honestly, that we can't keep playing these games and we have to look at the whole budget and our priorities. There are going to be a number of discussions around education. Where are the right investments? Should we be doing more on early childhood education? Should we do, be doing something about class sizes? Because we hear from students and parents and teachers across the state that class sizes are getting too big. And what are we going to do about higher education and tuition costs? And those are going up and really squeezing middle class families. I've got two kids in college right now. It's expensive to send your kids to the University of Minnesota, and I've got two there. And if we believe that education is the roadmap to prosperity for the state of Minnesota and the ticket for opportunity for um, our students and our young people, then we have to make that a priority. So I think there's going to be a very robust discussion about education, and I look forward to that. Representative Dell, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think, you know, our caucus is committed to, to paying back the delayed payments uh, in full. Um, we, we sent a bill to the governor to, to, to pay those uh, back. Um, at, le at least what we borrowed the last couple of years um, at the end of last session that was vetoed. We were a little disappointed that that happened. Um, and I, I'm, I'm encouraged to see that uh, at least in the House, House File Number 1 is a bill to pay back at least half of the remaining shift. When we took con uh, control of the legislature two years ago, um, we inherited a, a shift of $1.7 billion. Today that shift is $1.1. Um, we're pretty proud that that was paid down that much, but we need to pay that uh, uh, further and, and get schools paid up to the traditional 90-10 shift that uh, that they've experienced in the past. So um, we're, we're committed to doing that and, and, and we hope that we can do that as soon as possible. So um, a little little bit of concerns about this first bill and that there's not a funding source uh, identified. So we're hoping that, uh, that we can find that um, and that we can do that as soon as possible so the schools uh, have a little more uh, stability. And we, you know, I obviously, I, th I think we probably all here agree that, that uh, uh, shifting money or delaying payments to the schools is not a responsible way to solve the budget and and I know that's been used by both sides of the aisle uh, in recent years and and I think it's something we should stop so I'd look for some legislation to make it more difficult to do that maybe a higher threshold something like that but um, I'm hoping some legislation like that comes through as well Senator? well I think uh, we have used this uh, change in the shift that timing of the payments to schools uh, I don't look at it as really borrowing money. What we're doing and, and have done in the past is uh, 
delay the payments, if you will. Uh, the schools do get 100 percent of the aid that is due to them. They just don't get it at the same time that they expect. That does have a negative effect on schools in the first year that you do that. After you get by that first year, there's really no effect to the schools after that. But it is not a wise policy. Uh, we have done it in the years I've been in the legislature, I think, uh, three, maybe four times. Uh, but uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure if we're going to focus on what are we going to do for education and if we've got money that we want to devote to doing things in education. Uh, there may be better uses of money than just trying to repay that shift uh, more aggressively than it is already required to do under state law. We have statutory requirements that say that shift will be repaid as the uh, resources are made available to increase revenues. Uh, we've, as uh, Representative Dowd mentioned, uh, we've done a substantial amount of repayment of the uh, shift that was put in place in the last budget. Uh, if we continue to see the economy recover and the uh, revenues come in, uh, there's no reason to expect that won't continue to happen. And if we want to really do some things positive for education, I think you might find dedicating those dollars to something that is more positive would be more beneficial. And some of the conversations I've had with uh, superintendents would say, if you're going to spend money, don't just buy back the shift, do something real with it. So I think it's a conversation we have to have, but I do agree that it's not the best policy to go forward and how we should balance our budget. Senator? Well, I, I think we all agree that, you know, it's unconstitutional for the state to borrow money. So uh, what, what we've done as a gimmick, going back to 1983 was the first time a school shift was done, is the state has delayed payment and forced school districts to go out and borrow because we can't borrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, th th that's too bad uh, that we've taken that path now for a number of decades. Uh, I would like to minimize that. Senator Han is right. I mean, the current law provides for a mechanism for schools to be paid back. Uh, in the Senate, what we've identified as one of our priority bills, uh, Senate file number two, is uh, for the state to pay for all-day kindergarten. Now, there have been all of these studies done, much of it by the University of Minnesota, that shows the incredible brain development that happens in those early years of life. And uh, I think there's pretty general agreement at the legislature that early childhood funding is important uh, to the state. And I think what's interesting about that is even though we all agree on that, uh, as a legislature, we don't even offer all-day kindergarten for our kids. And uh, in fact, in law, there's no requirement for kindergarten. The school district doesn't have to offer it. Uh, the law says that when, a, when a, a child reaches the age of seven, they have to be enrolled in school. It doesn't say they have to be enrolled in kindergarten, so they can go directly into first grade. So uh, I, I think it's a worthy conversation to have at the legislature. If early childhood's that important, let's at least start with providing kindergarten. And uh, the state pays for half-time kindergarten right now. Many school districts offer it every other day. Some offer half days. I talked to a parent from Bloomington the other day that said, we have full-day kindergarten in Bloomington in our school district. State pays for half of it. I, as a parent, pay, I think she said, $375 a month in order to buy the other a half a day. Uh, it, it seems like if we think kindergarten is a good idea, uh, then let's pay for it. And I think it's an important conversation for the legislature to have. Thoughts on that issue? Representative or Senator, Senator, well, I, Senator. I think, uh, yeah, I've seen the bill that was introduced, and uh, it has been a discussion that we've had over the years. I uh, haven't seen the fiscal note yet. I think that's one thing that will help uh, inform the discussion. And uh, I, I think there are some, uh, uh, I think there is an opportunity for some discussion on all the kindergarten. Uh, I, I'm a little reluctant to make it a, uh, a mandatory choice that we, we would require everybody to send their children to all-day kindergarten, for example. I think uh, it may be that we want to offer it as a choice, and if people want to do it, that it might be funded or we might be able to provide some additional funding to do it. Uh, but I'm a little reluctant to say we ought to go out there and, and make compulsory all-day kindergarten uh, the law of the state. I'm not sure I'm ready to go there. Well, I, I think just to be clear, the way the bill is drafted right now, and, and it's pretty new, so I mean, yeah. uh, people haven't read the language yet, but. What it says is that if a parent decides to enroll their child in all-day kindergarten in the school district, the state has to pay the total cost of the pupil unit. So parents still will have, essentially it's kind of a voluntary program. If a parent thinks their child uh, isn't ready for all-day kindergarten yet, there's no requirement they have to enroll them. But if they do enroll them, the state has to pay the school district for the full cost of the pupil unit. Currently we pay half. Yep. Any thoughts on that? I, I, I agree with Senator Han, and, and you know my concerns would have been the same thing. But it sounds like, uh, and, and that bill hasn't—I don't think it's been introduced in our in our chamber yet. So uh, I, I haven't had an opportunity to read the language. But uh, I'd be concerned that wanting to make sure that it was an optional program, and, and certainly would be concerned about the costs as well. But uh, we'll have uh, plenty of opportunities, I think, to, <laughs> to debate this moving forward. Well, I'm glad that we're we're talking about it in the options because. When I think about schools going to four-day school weeks and I think about 30 or 35 kids in a classroom, um, when I think that school counselors and school nurses and school psychologists have been pulled out of the classroom 
It's not been that long since I've been a volunteer in a kid's classroom. It's hard when there are so many demands on one teacher, on one educator, and I think we're shortchanging our kids. So I'm really, really delighted to hear a more robust discussion about a really key priority for Minnesota, and that's education. Well, and I hope as we talk about education, in addition to the bill that uh, we've mentioned here, that there will be some focus on uh, increasing the literacy uh, for early uh, grades as well. We had some uh, uh, legislation that went through the last couple of years that I think made some very good progress in, in helping uh, kids who are at risk and developing those reading skills get better and see the test scores go up. And I thought that was uh, kind of an experimental approach and seemed to have uh, borne some fruit. And uh, I think that's another thing that we had to look at investing in as well to see if we can make sure we have more kids uh, reading at grade level by the time they get to fourth grade. I think that's a very good investment. All right, well, if you're from Pelican Rapids wants to talk about, let's, uh, Senator uh, Hamm, let's go to, uh, in your direction, wants to talk about local government aid and what might happen there. This viewer's specific question is whether the legislature plans to restore local government aid. It's a complex topic, um, been much in discussion at the legislature. Um, talk a little bit about it, and we'll, we'll throw it out on the panel for everyone. Well, I'm probably the least expert person on local government aid, <laughs> in, in, maybe in the legislature. Uh, the cities I represent, uh, none of them have ever received local government aid. Uh, I, I guess uh, my, my general concern is I think local government aid is a program that is necessary. I think uh, there have been efforts over the past number of years to try to reform it and uh, maybe uh, scale it back to, as I understand, the original intention, which was to try to make sure that all communities had access to funds to provide necessary services. But it seems like over the years some of that has kind of grown and grown and, and has become uh, more of a general fund to help uh, uh, cities and uh, meet their budgets and in some cases it's uh, in my opinion gotten fairly excessive so I think uh, over the years there's been an attempt to try to restore that uh, I think it might be wise to look at maybe there's a need to maybe regionalize LGA and look at regional centers and try to uh, do some things to recognize that they serve a larger community than just the people in their city and and do some things to reflect that but uh, I, I think it is a program that we need to have but I think it is in need of some continued reform um, you know, I, I served six years as a county commissioner, so uh, we received CPA, which is basically the same thing that's a county program aid. Um, and, and I think what local governments are looking for is a, is a program that has a little more stability. And one of the problems that I think we've seen in recent years, and it was my experience on the county board, um, oftentimes when the legislature runs a little short on money or looking for another place and, and the education shift has been one where they've uh, taken some money. Um, reductions to LGA and, and CPA have been have been frequent when the legislature has been looking for some money to, to, to fill other holes. So um, I'm not sure exactly what the future is, but I'd like to find something that provides a little more stability to the local governments and I think that's what they're looking for as well. Senator? Well, they're, they're, they're very good programs. Uh, and uh, you know they were the local government aid program was created in 1971 as part of the whole Minnesota miracle when the sales tax was raised and and uh, you know the argument is it doesn't matter what community you live in a fire truck costs the same amount of money and uh, some communities had a lot of tax capacity and it's much easier to uh, provide for those public safety needs than others and some have old infrastructure old sidewalks old water and sewer lines and uh, uh, some have new infrastructure so uh, some cities have that kind of overburden of old infrastructure to have to replace and and uh, and, and maybe oftentimes lower uh, property values on commercial industrial and, and homes so it's uh, uh, was intended to be the great equalizer I think the challenge in trying to uh, restore some of the cuts made in those programs is you know every budget cycle every dollar gets into competition and uh, I had uh, owners of assisted living facilities in my office today saying you know they they own three assisted living buildings and they said you know with the 15% the cut that they've taken in recent years there's a question whether they're going to be able to keep uh, their facilities open and I hear that from nursing homes all the time as we've made cuts in, in nursing home funding uh, certainly we need to invest more in our k-12 system we're running tuition up too high uh, so the, the, the question kind of becomes there's only so many dollars and they all get into competition in uh, in budget years like this and uh, I'd like to be able to restore some of them but I think the uh, the structural deficit problems we find ourselves in are probably going to take more than one biennium to resolve so uh, there's a long list of unmet needs in our state uh, and, and, and pressures and uh, it's probably going to take us multiple bienniums to get 
uh, people where they'd really like to be. Local government aid, Representative Murphy? Yeah, uh, you know, so I represent uh, a district uh, in St. Paul, and, uh, you know, I've listened to a lot of mayors, and certainly Mayor Coleman is one of the advocates for local government aid. Um, and I do think we're going to have to pay attention to that issue. But really what informs me on this question, um, and I didn't grow up in Minnesota. I grew up in um, Wisconsin, right? And I, I came to Minnesota. Minnesotans are, they're humble, um, but very proud of what they have built here. And Minnesota really is a lovely state, and it took me maybe a little while to understand what a treasure it is here and the sacrifices that people have made um, to, to invest in our communities wherever we live. And the, 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 I think the magic of local government aid is it does create this sense of equity regardless of where you live. And we have people aging in small towns uh, all across the state of Minnesota and I think that uh, we need to make sure that those are places where people's, people can retire, um, where people uh, can get the health care that they need, um, that the local infrastructure is there. Um, so there's 911 services and fire and police services that are available. And that's what local government aid buys. And if we don't pay attention to that, we're going to leave people in sparse communities stranded without the services that they need. Often they're aging, there are grandparents, the people who have made sacrifices for us. So I do think we need to think about local government aid and the commitment to Minnesotans wherever they live to make sure that they can live in the place that they choose and live safely. So Barry, now the question that every viewer wants to know, is she a Green Bay Packer fan <laughs> or, or a Vikings fan? I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> Someone had to ask. I mean, yeah. viewers are all wondering. You could either answer or I could advise you that you could take the Fifth Amendment on that question if you'd like. <laughs> I'm a Gopher fan. Oh, there you go. There you go. Well, I'm, that, I'm you a know, Gopher alumni. So. That reminds me of a question they asked uh, uh, Russell Anderson when he was sworn in as Chief Justice, uh, and they asked him about what his uh, political partisan preference was. He paused for a moment and told people, I'm a Lutheran. So, uh, <laughs> so that's a very similar response, you and go. you get points for that. Um, you know, this is actually a geographic-specific question. I'm going to pick on you, Senator Bach. Um, it's from that famous Minnesota town, unidentified town, but the viewer wants to know about the taconite tax and if there are going to be any changes in that in this session. Um, this is an issue that's more geographic specific than any other. So. Well, the, the law provides for an inflationary increase uh, in the tax. I expect that probably, uh, if the legislature is silent and does nothing, that will just happen. So it'll go up by uh, three or four cents a ton probably just by itself. I think the change that you're going to see, if that's somebody from up north, mm -hmm. is uh, the interesting thing about the uh, Iron Range Resources and Rehabilit Rehabil Rehabilitation Board, uh, I triple RB, mm -hmm is uh, in law it says that the majority of legislatures on the IRRB board have to have 50 percent of their constituents in their legislative district and as a result of redistricting that's no longer possible so we couldn't uh, consummate a new board and I haven't made any appointments to it because we can't meet the intent of the law so uh, one of the probably early bills in the session is going to have to be something to get uh, the IRRB board uh, situated so that we'll, we can meet the intent of the law. So I don't expect it to be overly controversial, but uh, we're, we're going to have to make some changes there. And to our viewer who called in with that question, if we didn't if we didn't get to the heart of the point you were trying to make, uh, call back and um, we'll we'll uh, we'll get back to our panel on that question um, as a, as the time allows. Um, several questions about taxes. Um, obviously, there was some discussion about taxes in the last election, um, how they might go up or down or whatever. Uh, we have a viewer from Rochester who wants to know uh, about reducing tax uh, burden on Minnesota businesses. Um, notes that it's a Minnesota is a high-ranked state. Another viewer in Morrison County wants to know whether or not there's been any discussion about moving to a so-called flat tax system. And, and other viewers, of course, are concerned about property tax relief and those kinds of things, which may result in taxes in other places going up. And so. Um, Given that framework of those concerns of people, let's start with you, Representative Dowdy. Sure. We'll start with you. Give us your sure. thought on the tax issue and, and maybe what you think uh, you'd like to see happen and what you think might happen if those two things are different. Well, I think. <laughs> um, well, I think that uh, you know obviously people are concerned about taxes, and I think the, the questions that are coming in probably show that. Um, 
you know, and people are concerned. I know I said earlier on that, that we feel like the economy is headed in the right direction uh, because of the policies we put in place over the last couple of years. Um, I think before we get into talking about, you know, I, I, when we say that there's a, a deficit, a $1.1 billion deficit, people, people think that means that the state is short of money and, and, or, or that the state needs more money. And I think it's important distinction to say that over the next couple of years, the state's actually going to have $1.7 billion more than we've had in, in this current biennium. So revenues are increasing. The, the problem here really is that spending is outpacing revenues. So we're going to have 5% more money to spend in the next biennium than we, set, than we spent in the last. And, and a lot of times when we get these deficits, it's because we've shifted spending um, you know, out, out further into the future uh, as, as kind of gimmicks and, and those kinds of things. I know that the $1.1 billion sounds like a lot of money, but over the last two years in that biennium, we've reduced that deficit from $4.4 billion down to $1.1. So that's a 75% reduction because of the policies we put in place, and we did that without raising taxes. So we shouldn't always assume that, that, that raising taxes creates more revenue. In a lot of cases, reducing taxes can create more revenue. So uh, we have to have some open and honest discussions about taxes and, 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 and how, the, how they impact not only the budget, but, but the economy. And I think that's the important part. We need to get our economy recovered so we can get people back to work in, in good paying jobs and attract job creators here to Minnesota. So we need to make sure that what we do isn't harmful to that environment. I think that's what people care about. Senator Bach, you've had something to say on taxes in recent weeks, as I recall. Well, I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what the governor's proposal is. I mean, the commissioner of revenue has held, I believe, over a hundred public meetings around the state uh, since we adjourned back in uh, uh, May, I believe. And uh, many of them have been with local chambers of commerce, with rotary groups, a lot of business people. He actually was uh, uh, this summer up in International Falls in my district and met with about 50 people from the local chamber of commerce. And, and I know he did that all over the state uh, to really kind of explain the state's revenue system, how it's changed uh, over the decades, the, the growing reliance on property taxes. and. And uh, I'm looking forward to see uh, what the Commissioner of Revenue and the Governor actually propose in the area of tax reform. And, you know, we all uh, kind of joke at the legislature, you know, the Governor proposes, the legislature disposes. So uh, we'll see uh, uh, how that goes, but it's an important conversation for us to have. Our, our revenue system needs some rebalancing and less reliance on property taxes. Representative Murphy? Well, I, you know, the notion that uh, if we keep taxes low, uh, means that uh, we'll have job creators come to the state of Minnesota. I think it's just uh, it's rhetoric and not necessarily true. I'm, I'm married to a job creator. I'm someone who owns his own small business. He's been here since 1980. And, uh, you know, I will tell you that every time I go home after we've had a debate about that on the floor, he just, you know, wants to engage in the debate one more time from a different perspective, right? Because his, his business relies on consumers needing the service that he provides. And when they don't have disposable income, when they're not earning a living wage, they don't have that disposable income to be able to purchase the service that he provides. So I think we have to think about supply and demand and um, both both the revenues, the, the revenue that people have in their pockets, right, as well as what people are paying when we think about job creators. And so I, I, I think Minnesotans are just, they're hungry for just real solutions and a real discussion. And uh, when, I, when I hear us talking about, you know, we got to keep the taxes low, um, so that, you know, people can create jobs and that is going to be a boom for the economy. I just think we're missing a part of the equation. So we do have to look at the tax code. I think we do have to think about how we reform it for a 21st century economy. There have been ample studies done on that. Governor Plenty commissioned one. The legislature commissioned one. There's a lot of information there. Um, I think we need to make sure the tax code's fair. And I think we can do that and probably raise a rev enough revenue so that we can provide for our schools in the way that we've already agreed that we should do as a priority. I think we should ask businesses and job creators, though, what what's important to them. If we're going to ask them, you know, or, or expect to, to have job creation in the state, I think we should be asking them. I think if you look at the, the chambers, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the statewide Chamber of Commerce does a, a survey. Uh, for the fifth year in a row, taxes is the number one thing that businesses are saying affects the decisions uh, on, on where to locate their business. So um, it is something they say is important. And, and uh, you know, we can look at the results over the last couple of years and see that we're in a better situation today. Unemployment's gone from 7% two years ago, 5.7% today. Minnesota businesses created 55,000 jobs in the last year. Um, just the other day, the Secretary of State put out a report that said that uh, uh, 
new business filings in the state of Minnesota are up 18% last year. Uh, second highest increase ever, I think. Um, so uh, we've got an environment where businesses are coming here and, and we feel like the economy is heading in the right direction. And, and, and taxes are important and businesses do look at this. And, and you, you don't have to look further than the chamber survey to see that that's their number one concern. So what we need to do is ask them. Uh, and, and, and they're the ones that know better than we do uh, you know, what they need to come here to be competitive. But I think we need to talk to Minnesotans as a whole yep. and not just the job <laughs> providers, right? Yeah, you, the you job creators, the job providers, they're all Minnesotans, yep. right? So we have to have a broader conversation than that one. It, it's interesting. I talk to a lot of businesses, and I think part of it, it goes back to being, having been the Senate tax chair and, and then the minority leader and now the majority leader. And, and I had uh, one of Minnesota's Fortune 500 companies in my office just a couple weeks ago. And I always ask the top-level business executives, the real decision makers, what's your most important concern? And uh, what this Fortune 500 company told me is they said, five years from now, 30% of our employees are going to be eligible for retirement. And we are very, very concerned as a Fortune 500 company, a Minnesota innovator, an innovator in the world, uh, are we going to have the workforce that we need to continue to be able to compete in this global economy? Uh, I, I think that is just the, one of the most critical things our state is facing. You know, we've all seen the numbers. 10,000 people are turning 65 every day in this country uh, as this baby boom generation moves into retirement. Replacing all of those workers with all that knowledge base that's going to go out the door with them is, is critical uh, conversation for the legislature to have along with the business community. Well, and I, I think the important thing, in my opinion, with this discussion is that we need to keep uh, some clarity about the fact that there is a difference between tax rates and tax revenues, that, that they're not the same thing. Uh, as uh, Representative Dow mentioned, uh, we've seen an increase in tax revenue coming into the state when we haven't changed tax rates. And the most important thing to grow tax revenue to bring money into the state coffers is make sure you've got a growing economy. And the real question with all this debate, I think, is when you raise taxes of whatever kind, how does that help the economy to grow? That's the question we should be asking. If you go out and say to the producers or the uh, people who are, have the money or the uh, businesses and say, we're going to take more money out of your pocket to bring to the legislature to do for other things, how does that taking the money away from you help the economy to grow when that is probably the money that would be used to hire more people or make investments in your business? That's the question that needs to be asked. And I think that, that in our opinion, and what we've seen in the last couple of years, at least from our perspective, is that trying to restrain that, that desire to increase the rates and do things to try to encourage investment, that's the way you grow the economy, and you will see increased revenue. And I think we should focus on that and not get too focused on just a, a commitment to raise rates because uh, there's sort of a you know, discussion out there that says we should do it. And, and think about how this affects the, the growth of the economy. Does it really grow the economy to take money out of the economy and bring it to the legislature? I think that's, to me, the sort of the question. We have a couple of questions from viewers. Um, no doubt we'll have a chance to come back to the tax question. I have a feeling we're not going to resolve it tonight. I don't know why I think that, but, <laughs> but I just have that feeling. It's, uh, I, uh, we could must, vote. We could vote and decide. Yeah, uh, maybe not. It's, it's, probably, it's probably that three years of legal training. It's, other people couldn't pick up on that. But anyway, we'll, we'll probably come back to that. Uh, we have a couple questions from viewers who want to talk about constitutional amendments. Viewer in Rochester, excuse me, Alexandria, wants to know whether or not there's any discussion about making the legislature unicameral. Another viewer in Appleton wants to know about whether or not there's going to be any change in the way we, uh, specifically, will there be any legislation, be constitutional amendment, to, to uh, limit the use of constitutional amendments or changes in the way we address constitutional amendments. Normally, of course, uh, well, constitutional amendments are voted on in the November of the election year, so you'd actually have two years to have that discussion. But um, what's been going on in that area, if anybody? Well, I saw that there was a bill that came in just, uh, I guess, yesterday about uh, changing the process to uh, adopt a constitutional amendment, making it a higher threshold. And we do have a high threshold to adopt a constitutional amendment. The public has to have an absolute majority of the voters, and we know that's tough. We saw in the last election we had two of them that didn't get adopted. Uh, but I, I think uh, that if you go back and look over the past, whatever, 20 or 30 years, there have been a number of constitutional amendments that have been put on the ballot, I think as many as five or six in one year. Uh, so uh, uh, I think the average has been a couple every, every election cycle. Um, many of them have failed. Uh, some have passed. 
Uh, I, I don't know if uh, it, it is a hard process to, to get one through the legislature in the first place, and it's a harder thing to get it to be actually be adopted by the public. So uh, it may be that uh, uh, this is the first time in the last, what, 40 years that the Republicans have put constitutional amendments on the ballot. People didn't like that. Maybe that's really the problem. We shouldn't have Republicans put constitutional amendments on the ballot. If, if we have other people do it, it's okay. But, uh, but I, I don't know that, uh, in my opinion, I think the, the uh, process is, uh, is fairly rigorous. There is a high threshold. Uh, uh, I, I think if you go back and look at how many have been put on the ballot and how many have actually passed, uh, I think it's uh, sort of a moot question of how much more you have to do to prevent uh, constitutional amendments. Senator Bob? Well, actually, I introduced the bill on this subject uh, today. Uh, Senate file number four uh, requires a supermajority of the legislature to put something on the ballot, 60 percent. And uh, uh, I, the bonding I, requirement for it, raising it's that 60 percent? It's the same requirement as we have in the Constitution for the, for the legislature to incur debt. And, uh, the, the intent of it is, is let's try and make sure that measures that are going to be put on the ballot for, uh, for Minnesotans to vote on, uh, let's make an effort to make sure there's a bipartisan vote on that. And, and to Senator Han's point, you know, this isn't a new subject to me because in, in 2010 I actually had a bill that offered a constitutional amendment requiring 60 percent, and it didn't get on the ballot in 2010. But what I learned in doing the research back in 2010 was, uh, 18, in 2010, uh, 18 of the previous 19 constitutional amendments passed. 18 of 19. I mean, so what you saw happen this year uh, was pretty unique for Minnesotans to reject an amendment because of the previous 19 before, and I think the one that failed was in uh, 1994, we ran one on paramutual betting, uh, off-track betting, and that one failed. But other than that, uh, the other 18 of 19 passed. So. Uh, I think it needs to be a tough threshold. I think we need to. Be, we, there should be some bipartisan support uh, to get it on the ballot, and, and I'm looking forward to the, the conversation. This was a very divisive election. These were very divisive amendments. You know, neighbors uh, with sign wars, vote yes, vote no. Uh, I think there's a lot of hard feelings uh, left, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I introduced it. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna hear it. We're gonna have a conversation about it. Mine isn't a constitutional amendment. It's just a statutory change in law. Uh, I think the Constitution is a very sacred uh, uh, document, and I think amending it is very serious business. Uh, I, didn't su uh, I didn't support the 2006 amendment that uh, took the uh, license tab money and committed it to transportation, took it out of the general fund. I didn't support the 2008 amendment that increased the sales tax uh, uh, by three-eighths of a percent. Uh, I don't think you should raise taxes in the Constitution either. I think the Constitution is a very sacred document, and I think uh, uh, more, a little higher threshold on the part of the legislature uh, to make sure we have a, uh, a bipartisan vote is important. You know, I think, <laughs> I, you know, I, definitely there's going to be bills probably in both bodies to do uh, similar things to what uh, Senator Bach is talking about, and, and uh, we can we can certainly have those discussions. I I also agree that the, the Constitution isn't something that, that you should necessarily change uh, frequently, I, I, I agree with him that taxes shouldn't be in the Constitution, and, and uh, um, you know, obviously that was the the previous one that had passed, um, and and you know, obviously these these two uh, that were on the ballot this time were rejected. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I <laughs> in in hindsight, to me, when we were putting them on, I I, I, I thought. Um, you know, we'll just let people decide. These are obviously issues that uh, that are controversial, um, and and you know, as I looked at the issues we were talking about, um, it certainly rose to a level where, um, you know, maybe the maybe this is bigger than what the legislature should be deciding. So, um, and and probably a bit naive in my my early career in the legislature, but um, I didn't see that it would be a big deal to have the people of. Minnesota having a conversation about it and making a decision, and 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 yes, they they were divided on the issue, but but I think we had a pretty respectful conversation about it, and, and ultimately Minnesota decided they didn't want to add those two provisions to the Constitution. So um, the process that we used worked very well, and and uh, ultimately, and and I didn't see it in my district, and maybe there were areas where it was more contentious and um, those kinds of things, but. Uh, but uh, the process that we used worked, and maybe it needs some tweaking. I don't know, but I'm I'm certainly willing to participate in the conversations about that. I've uh, also been an author of legislation that would change the threshold, um, and I uh, read Senator Bach's bill with interest today. I'm not sure it's my top priority or the top priority for our caucus, 
But I do think that um, what we saw happen in the last two years was an effort to, to put before the people a question that we were unable to reach conclusion about uh, through the legislative process. And we, I think, saw an effort to get around the governor and maybe a step away from the checks and balances that we're used to in our government. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. So if we're going to if we're going to continue to take questions to the people of Minnesota rather than legislate them i do think the threshold should change i do think there should be more requirement for bipartisanship i think the threshold or the number of legislators supporting that should be higher so that it's not easy when there is um, you know two democratic bodies or two republican bodies to go around a governor of a different party and eliminate that check and balance for the people of minnesota so while it's not my top priority, budget's my top priority, I do think it's probably a fruitful discussion for the legislature. I don't want to lose sight of our viewer from Alexandria who, who was specifically concerned about moving to a unicameral legislature. We get this question every, uh, I, I've been doing this program 25 years, I get this question from a different part of the state every time. Uh, and uh, I guess I'll just ask generally, does anyone know, anyone in the legislature that's planning on introducing that, uh, that constitutional amendment? Well, I haven't I, heard I, of any. I, it may get introduced. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the question that the viewer needs to ask themselves is, do you really want to make passing laws easier? Uh, because that's yeah. what it does. Yeah. I, yeah. Mean, I, I mean, I think our system of a bicameral system where both the House and the Senate have to, have to argue it out and take it to conference yeah. committee and resolve their differences, it makes getting things passed really hard. And frankly, that's okay. It, yeah. Sometimes even really good ideas take a number of yeah. years to get yeah. done. And oftentimes, at the end of the day, after a very difficult struggle over multiple years, the final outcome on that is much better than it would have been if you simply uh, had stacked up the votes and, and sent, it, sent it on to the governor in the first year. And I think we've only got one state that Nebraska, has a, Nebraska, Yeah, Nebraska's Nebraska. the only one. And I, I actually attended a conference with some, some uh, I think they call them senators from Nebraska. And uh, sounds like the wild, wild west. I also th think they don't have uh, campaign finance laws like we do. So <laughs> they, uh, I've even heard in Nebraska there have been debates about how they can have a bicameral legislature. They're kind of tired of it. They don't know the works. Yeah, so much. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, 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 well, I think the answer to our viewers' question is um, don't hold your breath. I think that's kind of the way that adds up. But I will say uh, to that viewer that, that we do have have two legislative sessions before you get to the November 2014 ballot. So um, talk to your local legislator to see if they might be willing to deal with that in either this session or next. All right. Viewer from Nisswa wants to, knock, wants to know whether or not the legislature would consider reinstating the seasonal or recreational property tax um, for school districts. It says property tax revenue. I'm not sure that's right, but I'm sure somebody here knows what that issue is about. Um, who wants to take a run at it? Are they talking about general education levy? No, I think they're, they're no. talking about voter approved levies. I mean, the, the, the oh, and it's and let me take yeah. it because yeah. it's yeah. a it's a real difficult issue in Lake Country. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. let me use Grand Marais as the example. And I know a lot of viewers uh, uh, go to Grand Marais. People in Minnesota love the North Shore. The challenge in Cook County, where Grand Mar the school is in Grand Marais, is the government owns about 91 percent of the land in Cook County. That's where the Boundary Waters, the big piece of the Boundary Waters, is. Uh, about 65% of all the tax capacity of that school district is seasonal recreational property. Uh, and then Niswa area, Breezy Point is very similar to that. Pelican Rapids is very similar to that. Cass Lake and Walker, uh, the St. Louis County Rural School District, the Lake County School District. The, the school districts in Lake Country have a real serious problem because most of their tax capacity, kind of their commercial industrial, is cabins. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in the 2001 tax reform, Governor Ventura uh, didn't want to have to pay school taxes on his cabin. And governors often prevail. And so so uh, seasonal rec was taken off of the voter approval levies. Commercial property pay it, homeowners pay it, but seasonal rec uh, is not subjected to uh, uh, voter approved levies. And it, it's creating a, and I tried to fix it a couple times uh, under Governor Plenty. I actually had an agreement with the Commissioner of Revenue at one point where we're going to try fix that. Uh, put some state aid into those school districts to help them be able to pass voter proof levies and it wouldn't have actually cost the cabin owner any money uh, but it would have helped those school districts that have a lot of seasonal rec tax capacity and and unfortunately i was unable to get it passed uh, governor plenty even though i had the i think i had the commissioner of revenue on board if i remember right so uh, it's something i personally still have an interest in i don't know if the legislature has an interest in it uh, i guess we'll find out uh, uh, it would it, it would it would cost real money, and, and, and uh, because I, I wouldn't expect that 
uh, cabin owners, we're just automatically going to raise their taxes by that amount. I think the state uh, needs to help participate in that. But it's a tough conversation, been around a, a, a long time, and districts like in, in Misswa, it's a very serious concern, and, and I share their concern over there. Any other discussion on that issue? Anybody have any insights you want to share with us on that? If not, we'll move to a viewer from Granite Falls. It's kind of like an auction here, you know. We move right on. If, uh, if you've got to speak up or, uh, or we're, uh, we'll just run right, run right by you. viewer from Granite Falls wants to know, how will the legislators come up with funds for complying with the Affordable Health Care Act? And I think what they're talking about here are the exchanges, among other things. And maybe we could have a little discussion about where that all sits in this session. Who wants to take a run at that? Anybody? Uh, Senator Hand? Well, I, I, the bill was introduced, uh, I think, today. And I did read it. I uh, haven't studied it extensively, but uh, the cost of the exchange, I think, is anticipated being paid for by 3.5% uh, uh, tax on premiums, uh, or up to 3.5%. So uh, there is going to be additional cost to uh, health insurance premiums that, to pay for the exchange. Um, I think uh, reading through the bill, there are some things that personally I think are concerning. I think the bill has got uh, some work to do if it's going to gain the support I think it would need to have to have it uh, be accepted as a bipartisan uh, approach to, to dealing with the issue. The governor is committed to getting something done. I, I, we all know that. Uh, but uh, there are going to be significant costs to the exchange. Uh, one of the things that I'm a little troubled with is it's not clear yet what the benefits are. And I think that's part of the discussion that needs to be uh, gone into as well. What do you get for this additional cost that you're going to put into the health care system that we don't have right now? And how is that uh, uh, benefit going to be determined? Uh, we do know it's going to have a cost. So I think uh, pre my preference would be that we not do it. Obviously, we had that argument the last couple of years. We didn't win. But uh, I think it's something that we're going to have to address this year. Uh, who wants to take a run on it at this side? We've only got about 45 seconds. I left. will. Okay, I think Mr. that, Murphy, uh, you know, we have waited for a couple of years to do the implementation. That's unlike Minnesota. Um, but we're going to move forward uh, in this cycle. Uh, I do think that, you know, we have to look at where our costs are right now. And if we move forward with the exchange, we're going to eliminate MCHA, which is the Comprehensive Health Association, which is paid for with a premium assessment. The premium assessment is going to go to the exchange as well. But finally, we're going to have a system that is um, that's going to make some sense, that it's going to be simplified, that people can navigate both in the private market and in the public sector, in the public programs for health care. And Minnesotans are going to have coverage. And those who don't have coverage right now are getting care, and everybody's paying for that. And we're going to stop right there. <laughs> I want right. to thank all of us for joining us. invite you to be with us next week and the weeks that follow. Thank you and good night. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org. Find out more about the history of the program, who's been a guest, and watch all our past episodes. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. You can also get involved and stay in touch by following us on Twitter and join the discussion on our Facebook page. Thank you for watching Your Legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of Meet Members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans.